Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I am Hody Johns. I'm Jordan Kleinsmith. And I'm Jacob Daniel. And this is Enemy of My Enemy, part of the We Are Libertarians Network. Uh, we got a good show for you guys today. It is certainly the hottest of the hot topics if you're a libertarian inside baseball person. Uh, we're going to be talking about the efficacy and efficacy of the uh, Mises Caucus and their messaging. Uh, Daniel, or uh, I'm sorry, Jacob Daniel is a member of the Mises Caucus. He is also a friend of mine, as is Jordan, who is not a member of the Mises Caucus. And uh, we're going to be just kind of talking back and forth about what we think about it uh, today. Again, the show, whole, whole concept is we give you left, right, and center libertarian ideas. I will start uh, being the center guy because I just kind of want to set the table for what we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, first things first, I am bummed that we're going to talk about the because Jacob was going to stand in for me anyway this week, and I really appreciated that. And then, like, the Mises thing became a hot topic, and then it was like, oh, no, I don't want his first appearance here to just be like, oh, talk about that thing that you always talk about every time, you know? But uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to get him uh, <laughs> back on the show and guest hosting some other times. Uh, Brian Wolgamuth was unable to stand in this week, but that makes this conversation all the better because then we actually have a member of the Mises Caucus to talk about the Mises Caucus. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I do feel sad about that, but, uh, it does have to happen and it will, it does make for enjoyment. So I do, I do this for the fans. I do this for, for the listeners. Um, things that I love about the Mises caucus, uh, their recruitment is fantastic. They do go very grassroots. They do go local and this is how it has to happen. Um, people want to change a national temperature overnight and that's just not the way it works. You start local, you win those victories, you you build up. We want to believe that we can just, oh, the next guy is going to win the presidency and then that's going to fix everything. Yeah. Imagine how one libertarian is going to do if the entire Congress is Republican and Democrats. Uh, it's probably not going to look great. So I, I, I love that they keep it local. I am a huge, huge fan of Austrian economics. So when I started, I was later in life that I fell in love with economics. Um, and I just started with the basics. I was like, you know what, let's, let's, let's start with Adam Smith. Let's move up and and read Hayek and let's read uh, von Mises and let's read uh, now and and I actually challenged myself to read a book from every economic group there was. Um, sometimes there's less, sometimes there's more, depending on who's measuring. But I read you know 38 different styles of economic books, and so I've also read you know Marx and Proudhon and, and and all that. And really, just after reading all of them, it is hard not to love the Austrian school of thought, at least for me. And I'm aware that this is a matter of opinion. Economics is the allocation of scarce resources with no alternative uses. A lot of people have different feelings about it. I understand that it is an opinion. I believe since we're libertarians, as long as it's voluntary, I am cool with it. But if I were to sign up for a voluntary system, I would sign up for Austrian economics. So the fact that Mises Caucus talks about it and leads with it, I do like that. Um, some of my issues with the Mises Caucus uh there's a uh there is a problem with focus a little bit that i think stan stems from plank seven uh which is their plank about about identity politics and now here's the thing i agree with what they say in plank seven that identity politics is just tribalism you look up identity politics and it's uh the uh, consolidation of people of single racial social uh, racial racial and social backgrounds uh, to try and consolidate them to vote only a certain way or try, trying to form a singular political identity with singular views. I totally agree with that. The problem is, is that I'll be like, hey, these guys are trying to prevent, uh, you know, transgender people from receiving medicine and they'll get taken down. It's like, well, hey, why did you guys have a problem with that? And the problem is always plank seven. Sorry, it violates our terms of identity politics. And that's, really not identity politics for me that's a human rights issue like you you got to let people receive health care if they want and that and it happens with more than just that obviously it happens with the border thing where i say hey these you know these people need to get let out of cages we shouldn't be separating kids from their parents and then it's like oh we took that down why we take it down well it's identity politics it's really just trying to consolidate everybody to vote a certain way and i'm just like I don't really understand how Plank 7 is used. It gets quoted a lot as far as why some of the like socially progressive stuff gets taken down that I that is kind of part of what I like about libertarianism. 
Um, Jacob has said before, and one of the things that I really like about this concept is that he sees it as um, uh, da, 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 da. it's a it's an economic term. It's where uh, separate separate people do different things. Division of, Division of labor. Here we go. Thank you, thank you, Jacob. <laughs> oh my gosh, my brain. Here I am talking about love and Austrian, Austrian economics. I forget principle one. Anyway, division of labor is fantastic. And I think he, and what he said is he sees it as the Mises caucus represents a certain brand. And they say like, hey, we're going to push these things. When you have division of labor, you need to work together with your partner. So for example, if I only focus on, if we're making shoes and I only focus on making the leather for shoes and somebody else is only focused on making the rubber, we want to work together and be like, hey, these shoes are like really cool. I make the leather. This guy makes the rubber and it's fantastic. Problem sometimes when you give it to Mises caucus is, is they're making the leather, they're doing the economics. And then when it comes to the social issues, they actually have some really disparaging things to say. And I'm aware that this is a generalization. I have to make generalizations when we're talking about Mises caucus because there's great people in there. Like I, like, I really like Jacob. I imagine, ja I, in fact, I, I shouldn't say imagine. I know Jacob doesn't agree with everything that some of them say. I'm making a lot of generalizations, except there is something when you see a post that gets like, a hundred reactions and two likes, and it's about being allowed to perform, you know, uh, uh, open borders, for example, or, you know, and then it gets a thousand likes and no comments, and it's about global warming or something, or, or uh, you know, being a, global warming being a hoax or something like that. And it's like, look, the whole thing is, I see, I agree with the division of labor thing. I think we got to be good business partners together, though. Um, not to be hypocritical, I have this exact same problem with the Audacious Caucus. I I have some really good friends over there in the Audacious Caucus, like uh, having worked with the Vermin Supreme uh, side of things. Those guys are some really good friends of mine. Mike Shipley and <laughs> Woods, uh, not, uh, no, I'm sorry, not uh, J James Weeks, Jeff, yeah, J uh, Woods. Mm -hmm. We have cut ties. He's, they, they both have said such terrible, slanderous, they, they've lied about great people. I can't, I can't do business with them anymore. I'm aware. I think there are only two members of the nine person caucus, but the problem is when you get a caucus together and you stay really quiet when somebody is slandering a lot of other people and lying about them, you don't get to suddenly play the high ground and be like, look at all these terrible things these Mises caucus people are doing, you know, if you didn't ducks aren't in a row. So the problem is I see these kind of two sides as like the opposite. Now, the reason we talk about the Mises caucus more than the audacious caucus, because the audacious caucus does not have nearly the firepower <laughs> or the manpower that the Mises caucus does. And they seem to be, it, it's unfair that one is spoken of more than the other, because I do see them as moral equivalents. Um, there is that I am fine with their social messaging, but they are very thin. They have a thinly veiled hostility when it comes to speaking about economic freedom. It's one of those things that you say, man, I just wish you would be audacious all the time. And I have that same feeling kind of about the Mises caucus. I'm like, man, I just wish you guys would keep that same energy. You know, like that would be so cool if like they could keep that as part of the platform. And I understand that Plank 8 says, you know, hey, it's not that we don't agree with all this other stuff. These are just our priorities. You just gotta let other people have their priorities too. Um, one of the big issues that, uh, another big issue that I have, I I've run some pages before um, and generally the Mises caucus when there is somebody who says like, for example, we have to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. uh, when that whole thing da went down, they called Spike Cohen a disaster and a failure. They regretted their in in ever endorsing him. Um, same with Joe Jorgensen. They said, you know, it's just time to let that burn, let it go down. Having run analytics for these pages, donors go up when we say stuff like that membership goes up and we might not like it, but it is another way to reach out to people. It's a group of people that aren't being reached out to. And there is hostility when we say stuff like that. And I think it's a weird place to make a stand because even if you don't think that people have to be anti-racist, it's still kind of a cool thing to do, right? <laughs> like it's, it's why not at least encourage people to be cool? So I, for me, I, I do feel that there is a disservice when we go, among people who have gone so hard on the Mises caucus. I hate the people that their, their whole page is just saying like, look at, I snuck into one of their Slack rooms and called them names for the last 15 hours. I owned the Mises caucus. I'm like, oh yeah, you look super smart, buddy. Like you are exactly the type of person that is galvanizing memberships. I want to like join them when I see stuff like that because it's just, it's immature and it's not fixing the problem. It's not changing anybody's mind, even if there is a problem. 
And I don't think it's fair to label it as 100% awful. I, I really, like I said, I love the Austrian economic side of it. When I hung with that crowd, and I was never a member of the Mises Caucus, to be clear. But, you know, when I hung with that crowd, the, you know, Dave Smith, Tom Woods, you know, um, Horton, you know, all those guys, they were like kind of my first introductions to like podcasting. And I didn't pick up on any of the bad stuff until a lot later. And then when the bad stuff came up, I was like, man, maybe that's just like a mistake. Like maybe that's like, that's like a one-time oopsie because I mean, hey, we've we've all had social media oopsies before. I, I'm certainly not uh, not angelic. I've made some mistakes with my messaging before, but there's a defensiveness around it that I I really wish wasn't there. And I think that it makes people say like, well, if you would just wholeheartedly, I think I think here's the thing: it's it's not that people are looking for condemnation because I think they like, look, I've condemned it once, and I'm not going to ever talk about it again. I think what people are looking for when we talk about these like kind of racist ish comments or when we associate with racists um, or bigots that we want to say, Hey, look, I will associate with them, but I strongly and unequivocally hate everything that's about their racism and I'll work with them on an issue and we'll talk about that issue. But I want to make clear to everybody watching me right now that this is where I stand on this. I don't want to see somebody have an issue about, talk about race, science, and then never get into the race science because they're like, well, I don't know. I just haven't bothered to look into it. It's an important issue. If you think that different races of people are biologically superior to other people, that's an important thing to flesh out. You can't leave a conversation and not do the research afterwards to say like, well, okay, I've talked to some, I, I've read some books about neurology and understand now and you know, talk to some geneticists and I understand now that, that race science is stupid. But when you keep, when you say, you know, oh, hey, I don't know. I just talk, I know he's a race scientist, but I just talk with him or whatever. It does give you that perception. It's not, a, it's not anything that we're strangers to here at the Weird Libertarians Network. We've had people that went full crazy before and we had to kick it. We had to put it down. The Mises Caucus does, will at some point police their own, but usually that comes at the point where they talk about, uh, what was the other day, talking about like, Oh, I see why you like why Risa Willis got raped or whatever. You're just like, dude, what? Like that it, and the thing is, is it was leading to that for a long time, and there were a lot of warning signs. And instead, it's just a boot after they cross the line, as opposed to a whole bunch of like, hey man, we're super inclusive of people that have been sexually assaulted. We think that's a really bad thing. It's not identity politics, it's just telling somebody you love them. And it's it's just something that I wish I'd see from these guys again. I'm not overboard on I don't get triggered when I hear about them. I just think it's one of those, those that's kind of what I wish I could do better. And so, uh, Jacob, I took a full 10 minutes. So as long as you want, friend, talk about uh, talk about the Mises Caucus, what it means to you and the messaging and the efficacy. Sure. And I'll, tr I'll try to address uh, everything you said. Um, let me start out with just like how I came to the Mises Caucus yeah. um, and kind of like wh why I why I'm a part of it, why I, I think it's a well, it's something I want to be a part of. And I think that it's a force for good within uh, the, the, you know, the, the world of liberty. So I know kind of like loosely, like through like a friend of a friend, Mike Heiss, um, I'm good friends with uh, Luke Emser, who's part of the Mises Caucus, and he kind of was my gateway into that. And so I've, I've known about them for a long time and seen them from afar. And I've always, since I've been a libertarian, been kind of an anti-political uh, libertarian because I just, I felt like politics were a waste of time. Uh, obviously the duopoly parties are like, there's no point in trying with them. And the libertarian party always just kind of seemed like a joke to me. It was like, you know, I mean, the, the, the two things that you hear about when that you'd, that you'd think of is that you get a bunch of like, uh, lukewarm people getting on stage saying, oh, we're fiscally conservative and socially liberal, liberal, which is just like, it's such a cliche thing to say, doesn't really like inspire everyone to, to, to join the party or look into it that much. Um, and, and, you know, and unfortunately, and I hate to, I hate to bring this up because like, I feel like he gets picked on so much, but, uh, people also think of James Weeks and, you know, the, the naked guy, that's the other thing that's commonly run up with the libertarian party. So... Uh, the Mises Caucus was like the first time that I, when I started hearing their platform and being told about them and seeing what they were doing, that was the first time that I kind of had a, uh, uh, you know, kind of desire to maybe get into to the to to politics into liber into the Libertarian Party, and uh, I didn't join it first, and I had some uh, you know, just other things going on, but then this past year, 
uh, started getting more involved, uh, both in the Mises Caucus and in my local party uh, in, my, in my county. And uh, I was actually asked to, to help moderate the uh, Facebook page because they just needed more people to help out with that, uh, mainly with uh, – so, like, my, my main job and focus within the Facebook group and social media as a whole is to help monitor the inflow of people who are asking to join the group. So I kind of – you know, it's not like a free-for-all if someone – asks to join they have to answer questions then we go through the list we look at their questions we look at the profile look at all their associations and and decide okay does this person seem like uh they're a good fit for us you know and it doesn't mean that we're uh a we're trying to weed out trolls and and also trying to weed out people that we think just you know aren't a good fit that they're you know um at the same time we we don't want libertarianism to just be a social club for people who are already libertarian um, and, and this is where I think a lot of the controversies, like the things that you brought up, uh, like one of the common themes of the criticisms of the Mises Caucus I get is like you guys let a lot of people in or associate with a lot of people that like aren't libertarian on this point or they say things that are kind of icky or that, you know, we don't like on, on these things. And, you know, listen, that's a tough balance. And I think every group, every, you know, private entity has a right to set their own uh, rules and guidelines for how they're going to try to recruit people. Um, everyone has their own sensitivities and stuff. I mean, listen, I'll say personally that I think racism is stupid, and I think, you know, it's it's usually vile and, and, and evil. Uh, at the same time, I've, I have family members in, in both sides of my family, my, my father's and my mother, who, like, I wouldn't say are like racists, like they're evil, vile people, but they just have some, some prejudices and some, some, some views that they've grown up with and you can't exactly disavow them of that but they're also not like bad people that i think should be disassociated with so you know there's a lot of times i feel like the problem is like we've grown up in a culture that wants to view things around uh sexism and racism in these black and white ways and it's not really that way to me i think there's kind of a spectrum and my main problem with racism with sexism with transphobia with anything is are you advocating for violence against a group of people and if you are well that's a problem that's a problem just because you know because violence is bad if you if you have incorrect or prejudiced or bigoted views about a group of people but you aren't advocating for violence well that's a separate category and i don't think that mean that means that you need to be uh like publicly rebuked and shamed i, I think that uh actually i think doing that sometimes produces the 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 counter effect when you take all the racists and or or people that have racist ideas and you publicly ridicule them, you, you, you kick them out of your groups, and you say, well, like, you're just, you're just an evil, bigoted person, and, like, I can't believe you said that evil, bigoted thing, and, like, you need to go, and, and you do, like, what I would call, like, the, the virtue signaling thing, where you go then to your public accounts and say, oh, look what this person said, we publicly uh, condemn that and all that. Like, that makes us feel good, and it, it, it certainly does make the people who are, like, let's say, someone made a racist comment toward black people, and we condemn that. Like, that might make the... the you know, people in the black community feel better. But I think what that does over the long haul is it is it takes all the people that have those bad ideas and lumps them in with other people that might have the same bad ideas or worse ideas. And then that's all they're hearing from. Um, so now it, it, it's a tough balance. Like you don't want to do the opposite where you just say, oh, well, we just think everyone's ideas are good and dandy and we have no problems with them at all. It, it, it's a hard line trying to walk where you treat people uh, as individuals and you don't just uh, summarize them or define them by like their worst beliefs. But while at the same time, you know, not wanting, like you don't want to encourage those things, but you also, you don't want to, uh, in my opinion, you don't want to cut off communication with people who like haven't let those bad ideas inspire them to violence. If they're coming to the Mises caucus, if they're coming towards libertarianism, then like I want to encourage that. Um, I, w I want to get them around people that have, you know, don't have those ideas or that, and that are, you know, going to help surround them with a culture of people that are promoting <clears throat> voluntarism, promoting uh, a stateless society or, 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 or a minarchist society. I, I think that's a better solution. Um, and listen, nothing's ever handled perfect. I'm sure we could sit here and go through a timeline of events and there's probably going to be some things that could have been handled better. And that's just, that's just life. Um, I think part of the problem too is that there's this weird hostility towards the Mises Caucus, um, in, in my opinion, where the conversations around the Mises Caucus are not 
of the majority of this nature. Like it isn't just people who would say we're friends and we're sitting down and we're talking and just like bringing up like, hey, can you like let's talk about this? Like this was kind of weird. Let's see what happened. Uh, like the nine out of ten times when I see someone bring up a complaint about the Mises Caucus, it doesn't come across as in good faith. It's like they already are convinced. Well, this is a group of alt right adjacent or alt right like actual alt writers that they're promoting entryism and they're bigoted and they're or they're Nazis and and transphobic and racist and this and that and like they start out from that preconception that 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 that, that belief they already have and then they're just like oh well see that you know will you condemn this no you won't because you are bigoted and it's it starts from this very nasty place of like you know just well we're already convinced you're bad and you have to prove you're not and that's just not a good way to go about like conversing with people uh, it's not like if you want to talk about being good good teammates when we when you brought up division of labor i agree like we should all try to get along and work together on the things that we want to work together on the things that 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 we can work together on and i'm not going to you know like yes i'm part of the mises caucus i'm also not going to be like an ignorant uh you know idiot like i'm sh there are times where leadership in the caucus have, have done things that I personally disagreed with, that I personally said, you know, maybe we're overreacting, maybe, you know, we're, 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 we're being too defensive. At the same time, I can understand where that overreaction, where that hyper defensiveness comes from. And it <clears throat> comes from like a constant, I mean, it is like a near constant uh, in, you know, the, the people on social media who have this vendetta against the Mises caucus, it's a near, it's a near constant barrage of either directly attacking the caucus or making these, you know, making these posts and making the wink wink about like, well, there's a part of the party that believes X, Y, and Z. And, 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 and it's just, it, it, it it's, I, and I don't think I'm being dramatic. It's near constant. Like every day on Twitter, I see, you know, one of the usual suspects putting, putting something out there. Um, I don't, I don't sense from the majority of leadership in the Mises caucus, the ones that I know personally and have talked to, that they're they're unwilling to talk about, unwilling to have conversations with people who identify themselves as allies and who want to have a conversation about something that they disagree with. But it's about how that's being done and where it's being done. If you reach out to, to Michael Heiss privately or you reach out to me privately and you want to have a conversation, neither of us are going to turn away from that if, like, you know, you're a friend of ours or, or you're coming in good faith. If you take to Twitter or Facebook, you know, and, and, you, and you publicly call us out in, in this fashion that's like, look at this bad thing that, that you did or look at this bad thing that somebody said, what are you going to do about it? I just don't think this is fostering... Uh, you know, a good path forward. It's it. So it, it's not that I'm going to sit here and say, well, the Mises caucus does everything perfect. And, you know, that's the end of the end of the story. Like, listen, like, I mean, people do things all the time that are like, we're, we're human, we're flawed, we make mistakes, people sometimes act defensively, they act irrationally, that's going to happen. Um, but I see the Mises caucus primarily as a bunch of people who I think have good intentions, who are under a lot of heat and are just acting defensively because that's human nature. I can't change human nature. I would love if, you know, sometimes we did kind of like not take things so over the top, but that is also the, that is the environment that I think has been created. And I don't think it's primarily the fault of the caucus. I think that there's a lot of people that are uncomfortable with the caucus for, some other reasons we can get into that isn't that aren't things that I think are legitimate criticisms, and they can't really get them on these things, so they have to hyper focus on these couple of issues, and instead of they're and they're not trying to engage in good faith. I guess would be my uh, summary. All right. So uh, apparently my mic was using the bad mic. I should sound a lot better now. <laughs> Jordan, uh, your thoughts? Sure. Um, well. I, I should say, uh, full disclosure, first off, um, I am actually a member of another caucus. Uh, I haven't really been hugely active with them, uh, but I am a member of the uh, Pragmatist Caucus. So I don't speak necessarily to represent them, um, but I do certainly believe very much so in their message. And really their core message in the Pragmatist Caucus is let's get people into office and let's get people into you know predominantly local uh, races first and kind of start a snowball effect of trying to get sort of the national conversation started. And um, maybe to just refer a little bit to uh, one of my favorite economists, um, Frederick Bastiat, 
Um, you know, he talks a lot about um, in some of his writing, the concept of what he calls that which is seen and that which is unseen. And uh, did I just completely lose you? No, I'm still here. Sorry, my my tech, my monitors keep flashing. So as long as uh, you you don't tell me otherwise, I'll keep going, even though keep I can't going. see. But um, uh, so, you know, he it really in his writing, he, he talks a lot about the impact of uh, in the law in particular, but in his work, um, that which is seen and that which is unseen. Um, talking about what the intention is for something, uh, in his case, you know, about legislation versus what ends up actually happening. And, you know, what is the actual end outcome of this action? And did it actually achieve what we intended it to, or was it counterintuitive? And, you know, Bastiat's conclusion in the law is the law perverted, you know, the law being used against the very ends of which it was conceived to, to perform. And um, it, I worry sometimes that there's a lot of unseen going on with uh, the Mises caucus at, at, and we're just seeing, for instance, what they see as wins in terms of um, a bunch of new followers, say in, in some key people's Twitter accounts or you know a bunch of new uh, people signing up to donate to the caucus. But what's going unseen are potentially you know tenfold that amount of people who are being alienated from the LP because of that messaging. And so I might compare it to a situation that I think um, Hody had shared in a, in a prior episode where um, he talked about a scenario where he kind of got people who had never even considered um, libertarianism and were kind of trapped in the false dichotomy of our uh, you know two party duopoly today. And um, he was talking to a lot of folks who were with the LGBTQ community and, and they, um, you know, were in the midst, I believe, of, you know, DOMA and a lot of the, the uh, Supreme Court rulings and whatnot that were going on. And his message of saying, hey, these guys see you can't get married. These sides, these, this side says you can, but we think the government shouldn't have a say at all. And that kind of perked up a bunch of people's ears and kind of, you know, got into a new audience of people that would have never even considered um, libertarianism. And I, and I think, um, you know, right now, I tend to think that we're, we're kind of in a position of we, we need to value more than anything getting butts in seats. Uh, you know, and that's kind of something we talk about when we launch a new product, for instance, in the software world is like at the very beginning, it's all about just getting people using it so you can start feedback loops and you can get information coming in and you can figure out how can we better, um, you know, message to this new audience that we've just cracked into that we never thought we could crack into before. Um, but you also have to be kind of careful with some of that too and figure out, you know, is this an audience that we want to try to reach or is this poisoning the well? And the, the other area that I would um, have to really express a lot of concern from what I've seen with the Mises Caucus, and, and I, should, I should clarify that, you know, there's a difference between what is in, say, you know, the Mises Caucus's um, uh, platform statements, and then what I seem to see by way of behavior on social media, and then, um, you know, behavior of, of uh, sort of endorsements of, of others on social media um, and things that they might be saying that aren't so um, inviting to other folks that might be wanting to, to potentially consider it. And so I think, you know, there's this kind of refrain that uh, the uh, that the Mises caucus can kind of retreat into sometimes, which is that oh, um, you guys are just call us racist all the time. So we're going to crank the edge lordism up to 11 and we're just going to be racist to trigger everybody. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it seems like there's this, you know, intention to trigger the libs more than advance the cause of liberty. And, and you know, that would be very much the same critique I would levy against most of the supporters of Donald Trump is that it was more about, you know, hating and hurting the enemy than it was trying to advance themselves and the society. And um, unfortunately that that I see that, and, and you know, you might even call it uh, or hark back. I remember, you know, years ago, uh, I would say both are kind of anathema in the libertarian movement at this point, but um, Chris Cantwell debated Jeffrey Tucker uh, about brutalism versus, um, you know, the mainstream um, uh, libertarianism of more so embracing, you know, some level of empathy for others. And I, I feel like Mises, the Mises caucus has kind of grabbed the the flag of brutalism and started running with that of kind of saying, OK, hey, we're going to we're going to be brutal and we're going to cause a conversation. And the problem is I worry that there's an opportunity cost to that conversation that's going unconsidered, that part that which is unseen of all of these people 
that are witnessing this in silence from the sidelines that had been considering potentially reaching out to somebody that had expressed views of liberty. But all of a sudden, that same person who expressed views of liberty, maybe that person expressed views of uh, wanting to help small business owners. And this other person was a small business owner. And maybe that small business owner had lost faith in the government and they were really no longer, you know, re re ready to to listen to what Joe Biden had to say next. And we have, you know, this prime person ready to hear the message of liberty and they're starting to hear it and starting to come around. But then they see a post about something celebrating, uh, you know, a law in Missouri being passed to prevent transgender athletes from participating in school sports. And they see this person celebrating that. And this person, you know, who's witnessing from the sidelines happens to have a child or a niece or nephew that is, you know, having the similar challenges. And they now all of a sudden instantly lose all respect for that person who's now, you know, uh, trying to you know, put out this message of liberty, but they've inadvertently now tainted that. And they never even know because they've completely killed that opportunity on the vine. And that's, I think, the saddest part of all of this that worries me. And it, and it really worries me with, if you if you think about um, what, say, the Pragmatist Caucus is doing, you know, the Pragmatist Caucus, first and foremost is, let's fight for things like ballot access. You know, like, what's the very base most thing that libertarians need to do to be a party. Well, we got to show up on ballots. So they fight for that. They fight for then making sure that people are supported in uh, small races in. Did uh, Jordan cut out for you, Jacob? Oh. Uh, unmute yourself, Jordan. I think you I think you're back. Say hey, hello, back, Jordan. Jordan. Oh, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can see him. Oh, unmute yourself and then try talking. Let me see if I can unmute him. Oh, can't unmute your guests because they refuse to mute themselves. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to let Jordan finish when he gets back. I mean, here's his thing. Well, okay. So, Jacob, I, I guess you're the natural guy to respond to some of the things that Jordan said there. Go ahead. Sure. And I, 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 um, trying to figure out the best way to respond to this. So can sometimes uh, the Mises caucus put out a message that might turn off some people? I mean, I guess that's possible. Uh, at the same time, are we not, like, isn't the opposite true is what my thought is. I mean, if, if the pragmatist caucus or the audacious caucus or some other libertarian figure uh, puts out something that is kind of appealing to what I would refer to more as like the, the leftist or SJW kind of woke crowd, is that not going to turn off maybe a small business owner who was really like, you know, well, Donald Trump didn't do anything for me. The Republican Party is kind of a joke. Like, maybe I really need to start considering libertarianism and then... Uh, you know, they see something from, you know, Jorgensen, like we must be actively anti-racist. And then that turns them off. So there's always opportunity cost. I mean, there's always, if you try to pander to one side, yes, you will probably turn off the other side. And I think what the Mises Caucus is saying is, well, you know, we, what we, the Mises, everyone in the Mises Caucus tends to agree with is that we really don't like a lot of the, uh, the, the, the kind of more socially progressive, uh, uh, or what's sometimes called like the culturally Marxist, you know, uh, like we, we don't really like that stuff and we don't like when the Libertarian Party is is flirting with, with that stuff, um, nor do we like when it's flirting with uh, Donald Trump or being a bunch of bootlickers. Like we just put out a couple of posts over the past few days about the, uh, you know, the, the ongoing thing with Kavanaugh and uh, uh, not Kavanaugh with the, uh, uh, what's the officer's name that uh, killed George Floyd? Um, Derek Chauvin. Yeah, Chauvin. Um, I don't know why Kavanaugh came to my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, but with Freudian uh, slip, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like we and then we had some just like a couple of disgruntled people commenting on our post, being like, "Oh, uh, I guess you guys are just a bunch of communists and Marxists now because you're you're saying the same stuff the left does about the cops." And we were just, you know, it's just it's silly. Like anytime you put a message out, I mean, it's, isn't that kind of like the basic the basics of economics? You know, at least the, from the Austrian perspective, is that like whenever humans act, you are giving up, you know, like to act, you are giving up the opportunity to do other things 
to do the thing that you're doing. Like you, you kind of, you form, you form a value hierarchy and you say, well, I view this as being more important than all these other things. And so I'm going to act in the pursuit of this in, in, in the pursuit of this, uh, uh, of, of what I want to gain. So, you know, there, there's no way we can appeal to everybody. And while, I mean, I would, you know, I don't want the Mises caucus or libertarians to be out there, uh, saying things that are, uh, like, you know, like blatantly attacking trans people, of course. Um, if, if there's people that don't like, like, listen, like th there are people who see like the inclusion of transgender people in sports as a negative. And that's a conversation. I mean, there's, uh, you know, I've, I've looked into this a little bit. I personally think there's a way you could include transgender people in sports. You'd have to like restructure everything a little bit. Um, I think there's a way to do it. I don't think it'd be bad to do it, but I can understand and I empathize a lot with the people who are concerned about it. Um, that's not something that I think there's an obvious right answer to other than that I think the libertarians should say, well, the state just shouldn't be involved in it. And I think private entities have the right to decide for themselves how the, how they're going to operate. Um, sure. And we, we should try, you know, we should do our best, I think, not to uh, overly cater to one side or the other. I don't think the Mises caucus should just bend over and just like say ev everything to appease like the Trump crowd or anything. We don't like we, we, we do sometimes say things that might be more appealing to, uh, people who like aren't socially progressive, but we, at the same time, there's a lot in our platform that if someone's not, you know, if, if someone's really deep into the Trump crowd, they're really not going to be comfortable in the caucus long term, And, and that's, that's played out many times. People that like they come in maybe because, you know, and listen, like if we can appeal to someone in the Trump crowd and bring them towards liberty, to me, that's a win. Anyone we can bring towards liberty is a win. But like we have to, we, we can't be tone deaf to the fact that there's a culture war. And I don't think that we should pick sides on the culture war. But like at the same time, like, so there are I, people. I got to ask both... you a question. I got to okay, ask go you a question, Jacob. So let's look at the math. You know, um, LGBTQ people under 10% of the general population, trans people, really small percentage of the population. Yes, we're having, you know, some conversations about it. But as Andy Craig, who's a member of the Pragmatist Caucus, who I really appreciate a lot and, and um, really appreciate his, what he authors. Um, one of the things that he, he kind of called out is he's like, you know, I was reading Human Action the other night and I read a lot about, you know, marginal utility and things like that. But I must have missed the parts about, um, you know, keeping all of the trans people out of sports and whatnot. And, and it just seems like for a caucus that calls itself the Mises Caucus, which I have to admit I have a problem with because I think you're, you're, the caucus is misrepresenting a man who I have I hold in great esteem. Um, I consider him one of my own personal heroes. I went to college at the college that hosts his personal uh, library. I got to sit amongst his personal effects, sit at his desk, read his personal library. I own a copy of his wife's book, My Time with Lou, that was signed by her, um, which is awesome, Margaret Von Mises. And to see some of the things that get associated with his name, I have to imagine he would have a problem with. Um, this is a man who was an Austrian Jew who fled Nazi persecution um, to the United States. And if we had the system of immigration in place now that we, or then I should say that we have now, he might not have been allowed in. And, and it seems like the Mises caucus wants to have this preoccupation with cultural Marxism and that this idea of fixating on these others that are coming in and challenging our longstanding way of life. And, you know, the sort of crap you see gab.com post on Twitter and like their stupid, like Aryan nation worshiping uh, sort of visuals. It, it, it just seems like why the preoccupation with this stuff? Like you have the whole, um, you know, plank to it. Why not the military industrial complex? Why not go after the Federal Reserve? We do. Why not go after? I mean, and we do. You may say that, but that's not where all of this conversation is going. And and there's this weird courting of the Hotep movement, known anti Semites, and this inability to disavow them, like Angela McArdle coming out and getting asked, like, 
what do you think of this person saying that the Jews run Hollywood? And she's saying, oh, well, people should be able to ask questions. People should be able to ask questions. And like what Hody always says is, yeah, it's fine to ask the questions. But after a while, if you don't listen to the answers and actually assess like the actual data in front of you, and that's not a be- that's not a good faith asking of that question any longer. So I just got to ask you, Jacob, why the preoccupation? And, and I, I got to say, like, I, I, you know, see everything of what people latch onto and whatnot. There just doesn't seem to be any activity around anything else. If there's other stuff going on, if you're trying to get candidates into office other than just internal LP positions, I'd love to know about it. But all I ever see is just tearing down people in marginalized groups and alienating people out of the LP in general. So why? Why? I, I, okay, I mean, uh, I don't say this to, to, to be offensive to you i don't know you personally but i I just think that that's a disingenuous statement to say that our our focus is owning the libs and cultural marxism i mean that that's nothing we do except like in 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 response to people who are like criticizing us i would say is really focused on that like we're out there and the things that we talk about the loudest are the military industrial complex are the wars that are going on overseas it you know we 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 had like four or five posts over the past day from the libertarian mises caucus facebook page talking about uh uh the, the ongoing like police brutality problem and so that that's there. fine but and, why and, go out of your way to troll other people and like the anti-racist messaging why go out of your way to tear that down it's, it's not, rather not than going, just the division not, of labor thing. it's not going out of our way it's that people are coming to us and saying why aren't you this way and we're saying because we don't like that and yeah i don't like the cultural marxist stuff i don't like the sjw when i mean listen it, it didn't I mean, where it is violence me. involved in those equations though that i mean you're allowed to like that you're allowed to dislike things even if they're not like oh i know yeah, i know but I mean, so, so so i mean listen something can be harmful to society without it being like inherently a call to to violence like like i just think that's a kind of a silly question so it's interesting you say that because earlier you said something about the effect of you know it's okay as long to say anything you want so long as you don't call for violence but you just kind of made that's the point that said. I did not say anything's okay as long as you're not calling for violence. It's not what I said. What I said was my main focus is if if someone's calling for violence, that's bad. That needs condemned. If someone has bad ideas but they're not calling for violence, then while I still disagree with those bad ideas, that's not a person I'm going to come out and, like, target them and attack them in the way that you guys want us to attack people. Like, you guys see someone that says that, that says some, something like politically incorrect or, or something that might be – uh, you know, m- mildly racist, but they're not calling for violence. And you guys want us to do what you guys do and to go out and say, well, we we publicly condemn this and we, we're anti-racist and all that. And like, you want us to engage in these word games, engage in these, these, uh, the, these, the same kind of virtue signaling that the left, that the, 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 the SJW stuff that, that they, they do. And that's not what we're about. That's not how we engage. So you have selective, one of the things I wanted to, to kind of ask you about was, um, you know, I, I understand this idea of condemning performative callouts, but when you talk about things in a public um, sphere, you have to be ready to be called out publicly. If you make a statement, you have to be re- in a public, you know, area. You have to be ready to have that but conversation people, people publicly. Aren't, people aren't primarily coming to the caucus and condemning us for things that the caucus publicly says it's 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 disingenuous people like in the fakeitarians group who have their sock accounts everywhere or that are monitoring just followers on twitter and looking like look at all the look at the thing that this person said and blasting that for everyone well to see. these are they're, individual they're, members are, who represent your caucus First of all, not everybody who is in the Facebook group is an actual vetted member of the caucus. We let people into the caucus group all the time that are just like, we want to learn more. And, and if, if we well, think and, and I'm not necessarily faith, we let saying that we, let them we have we have onboarding processes like I, I'm, I'm part of the process in my state of PA where we we vet people and we invite them to join like a like we do it twice a week. We have a, a Zoom call for onboarding where we like to talk to people and get to know them personally and vet them before we actually add them to our list of official members. Sure. Just because there are people on Twitter or Facebook who follow us or that are maybe in the group 
uh, that doesn't mean that they represent us. And the problem is this just disingenuous, bad faith focus on the like on just like finding all the the bad things that you can find. Listen, the internet's a cesspool. Like it, and we are all part timers. Like and Mises, and Mises is the eight chan of the libertarian mar- movement. That's what I would. Okay. That's what you guys are. You, you can say that. Uh, the, li- listen, we're a bunch of part timers. Libertarian Mises Caucus is not a a, a a group, right? I mean, now we're talking about uh, changing this, but right now. There's there's no full time paid staff. We're a bunch of people with full time jobs and families and lives. Our focus is not to patrol our groups and Twitter feeds for people that say mean things. I'm sorry. That's just that is well, not question a good whether use Josh of our time. Smith has a job or he's just bilking you all. But I'll put that aside for now. All right. Okay, so Cody, 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 you pop in. <laughs> all right. Let me let me, me go here a little bit. I, here here is my thing, Jacob. Because I understand what you're saying, and not everything's you know you can't. You know, you you get big, you let everybody in the Facebook group, you see certain things. You know, I don't see the caucus, right? I see the people that have the Mises flag and I'm just like, okay, I I guess this person associates with you. You know what I mean? And if they got a white hood on, then it's like, uh, okay, I guess anybody can do it, right? That's not really your fault because anybody can put a Mises flat banner on their photo. We've asked people to take our our badge off their profile when we, when they've missed, when they've like given us like when they're saying things and like, no, like, why are you saying that? You're not even part of our group anymore. We kicked you out. Take that badge off and stop saying these things. Right, right, right. There's not, but like, like we, we've, we've asked them to, they don't. Right. So I get that. Now here's my thing, because you're saying like, and and I think this is kind of maybe the crux of what Jordan is kind of getting at, because you can get kicked from the Mises caucus, Facebook group. If you make an open borders post, I've seen it happen before. You make the post in the group, you get kicked out of the group. They're like, "Hey, that's it, Paul. You knew that rule going in. You're gone." You know what I mean? Whereas they can choose their ideological. Whereas if you make a reference, for example, somebody says, "Imagine caring about trans rights," quote or some shit, unquote, and that's Dave Smith. His post is still up, and he's of course not kicked from the cop. We've had two posts in the group uh, over the past week that were pro trans rights that weren't removed. Okay, and so like I'm saying, this isn't like a hundred percent thing. But what I'm talking about is like the optics of that. When you just say like, "Man, I just posted an open borders thing that got deleted immediately." It divided, it, and the ones that don't get deleted get like a bunch of pushback. And oh, here's my messages from a guy who didn't delete it who said like, "Hey, watch it with that. I don't want too much of this in the group." Whereas somebody says like, "Ah, oh, trans rights or some shit," and that still stays up. And we, you're just kind of like, can I you know, it doesn't we, feel. Can right. I explain why we remove that stuff? Yeah, 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 for, yeah. A lot of the time, because yeah, I mean, a lot of well, first of all, we'll probably most of the time not let because uh, we put most people on post approval, um, and for the most part, we don't want the conversation within the caucus groups to be about uh, borders or trans rights or, or or cultural Marxism or or, or any of this stuff. Like, how is borders focus. not a legitimate issue to talk about though? That blows my mind. But go That's on, Austrian to the core, right? Yeah. All right. Well, let me let me let me finish what I was saying, sure, and then I'll yeah. and then I'll hop to that. Um, or, or I guess I can explain it in my answer. So the caucus has a platform, and listen, we can't we you can't when you act in the world. Like I said earlier, you create a hierarchy of values, and you say here are the things that we think are the most important to act on. We can't do everything. We have to prioritize. Um, I would like I would put money on this. At least sixty to seventy percent of people within the Mises caucus are open borders. In terms of their of their of their preferences, I'd agree, but that's not the focus of the caucus because we can't focus on everything. We we focus mainly. Then on the what wars. is your focus? Okay, well, have you have you ever have you looked through our platform before? I have, but what okay. is it? What our is fo- the our our, our focus is is the Federal Reserve. Our focus is the wars. Our focus is the war on drugs, on police reform, on and criminal justice reform. And how do you intend to on, get, address on... any of those? How? Okay, well, uh, that's. I mean, I can't give you a 10 second answer to that. Like there's a whole strategy. we. But have. like the, li- li- but the like the, li- have, you, the... have you ever, I mean, have you ever asked these questions in good faith, not in a debate where you're coming in? There's like, well, you guys are just a bunch of people who are, like, I, have, I mean, actually, okay. um, and, I, and, and, in, in, but the thing is, it just doesn't seem like there's ever any concrete plans other than shit posting. I'm going to ship post. I'm going to get people to follow our me. Plan We're is to raise, our plan is to be the caucus that raises the most money to support candidates. First of all, okay. that's, one of, that, that's so, one of the parts of our plan. We where, raise, we, how much we, money have you given in, into which candidates? I, I don't have those figures in front of me. I'm, but I, talk to our do you have a ballpark? 
Um, last time I looked at the um, the numbers, so like I think over a two year period we raised over thirteen thousand dollars, and and okay, a lot of I mean, that that's went, commendable. A, a lot I, of that, I mean, a lot of that went now. Like some of that goes to uh, like the the, the, the messaging, Josh outreach, Smith, the website. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, not not really a lot to Josh Smith. I mean, some some to Josh Smith because he was a candidate running internally. Mm-hmm. We did we did get him some some money. I believe that's on the. Uh, uh, and you can look all this stuff up, by the way. Like, this is all, like, we're a caucus. Like, you can I was, saying, God, the... I was gonna say, I saw an Excel sheet of it. Was, well, like, like it's answer. all, I'm it's forgetting the, Stu, um... are you a private, are you 990? Do you file a publicly inspectable nonprofit return then? <clears throat> I, I don't know about our... Or politi- okay. 11, or it might be a political oh, oh. organization. I, I forget know. the, I don't have it, it's like, I'm, I'm just having a brain fart, but, like, any caucus that raises money, uh, there's a, a site you can go online and basically see all the money coming in. You can see all the disbursements. It's all labeled. You know, it's all, it's all, it's all there for people to see. And I used that to – last time I got on there was to debunk the claim that Heist was taking $3,000 out <laughs> every two months, which is just false. Like, like, you can go see it. This is public data. Like, I mean, like he took $3,000 out once because he furloughed his payroll for six months while we were in election season and we were focusing on giving money to candidates. And then at the so very he, end of 2020, he, you know, him and other people got got uh, paid what they hadn't been getting paid for a few months because our focus was on uh, funding candidates. And we have funded a fair amount of candidates. I mean, not when we're, we've been a growing, a growing caucus and not 100 percent of the money goes towards candidates right now uh but it's a fair bit it's between it, it's like i want to say last i checked it was probably in the neighborhood of like 30 to 50 percent somewhere in that neighborhood but and we've even those... given we've even given candidate money to candidates that weren't like pro mises we've given money to candidates that we didn't agree completely on you know what do you remember that our preferred candidate for the nomination for the libertarian uh presidential nominee was jacob hornberger by the way that guy is like overtly open borders. Like there's a great commercial he had. If you haven't seen the Jacob Hornberger <laughs> like open borders commercial, you should check that out. It's very good. Right, but I'm just like I'm just like if we're a bunch of like uh like a bunch of alt riders trying to appease like Trump supporters, like Jacob Hornberger was the worst choice of someone so, for us to endorse and and try to get I, nominated. Like it's just I, so I, I agree. Just, I, no, yeah. and, I, and I want to acknowledge my own sort of bias in this. Like, I'm going off what I see people talking about on Facebook and what they see them supporting. I think, you know, again, my anecdotal perspective, though, is I have never seen a Mises caucus member advocate for anyone other than an internal race, meaning the chair for the LNC or, you know, an at large position. I've never seen them actually run for a position I mean, are, I, I in mean, local or, or you know, state government. Um, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, maybe it's not like something that gets publicly put out there on the public libertarian Mises caucus page that often. But like in our private groups, a lot of times people will come and we also have state groups and people. So are that speaks sharing. to the, the preoccupation, though, with other topics yeah, what's, what's other than getting these people the, in office. But what's the, everything has a different purpose. The purpose of the the Facebook page that's like that has like that goes out there and puts out messages isn't to raise awareness about candidates it's to put out the messaging of the caucus but like internally we are promoting the campaigns of different people that we're supporting and asking for for people to donate and stuff i mean we we do that plenty i mean so i i just i just feel like and, and like listen my my point is not that everything the caucus does is perfect and there's never room for criticism like right. there's always room for criticism and growth, but ninety percent of that is not coming from people in good like coming at us in good faith. It's like people coming at us in this combative attitude, starting out with the like they're already convinced, like, well, you guys are just a bunch of alt right like Nazis, and you're trying to flood them into the party, and you're trying to, you know, like like they they just think all these nasty things about us, and like. Now that creates, so back to when you asked, why are these posts deleted? Sometimes we delete or we block posts about open borders or trans rights or this or that, because it's just, well, that's not the focus of the caucus. And then sometimes uh, that stuff is is taken down. Because, but then you let Dave Smith put his stuff up and keep it on, right? That, I mean, that was Hody's point earlier. You know, when he when he says something that's potentially inflammatory and completely outside the scope of what you, you want to focus on, it's cool to leave his up, though. 
And that's where I, there's inconsistencies. I, I, I that can't remember the. I can't remember us. anything inflammatory that Dave Smith has really posted. What was it? What was the office. quote? Trans rights and shit. Said, who? Yeah, with the wars going on, who cares about trans rights or some shit? Okay. I so mean, I and and and, and, and now is, now that's his Twitter post. That wasn't a Facebook caucus thing. Sure, that's sure. And, but okay, I think but, that, he, he, but we have no control over what Dave says on Twitter. And, sure. And but, and, but, and, 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 and I want to be consistent in, in that. But and, it, and, it's different from having saying like I, I think for me here's what it is. It's saying I have no control over that, versus when I post something. Even if it, let's just let's not talk about Mises at all. When I post something about open borders, I'm going to get at least five Mises caucus people to say like, what right. is this cultural Marxist shit? And they go out of their like, way, to, and I'm just like, bro, I don't even know what to tell you right now. Like, right. I can go so Austrian on your ass about open borders. That is literally why Hayek left socialism because Mises convinced him that open borders is an cool. awful have, practice and it is required for capitalism. Number that, two yeah. on your plank is Austrian economics, right? And that's number yeah. two. Yeah. Okay. So when we're yeah. talking about things that you do focus on, right, with as far as importance goes, capitalism requires the free movement of people. It's it's baseline principle I and mean, chapter one type thing right. requires the free movement of people so that you can so that you can have division of labor and so when i say see something like and borders get deleted and they're like yeah it's cultural marxism i'm like no it's capitalism 101 like right. this is why is open borders when and you even said it yourself on the show why does that strike you as cultural marxism then as opposed to austrian economics like why does I, it, why I, does I, it I, I agree with you that the, if that if a person now i mean i can and, I, I can, can understand. I know where you're where gonna go. Person, I'll tell you afterwards, but okay. I can understand the mindset of maybe some 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 more right wing libertarians, where like they've only ever heard the open borders argument from the people who also put out the cultural Marxist stuff. So they've made an incorrect conflation of those things, two things in their mind. Um, I would have a conversation with them. I'd be like, no, listen, actually, here are some good, strong economic arguments, you know, from from Hayek or from guys like Brian Kaplan for why open borders are are actually you know yeah. good but like listen again but like but that's there's going to be people in the caucus that have views on immigration that i personally don't agree with um and maybe you put out a post out there and they attack you for it okay what do you want the caucus to do about that I'm what do you want to promote a culture that's that? inclusive rebrand take I mean, Macy's off of it because that's I think what you can me, do for me and i'll I stop talking me, about if, it if people who follow this podcast who follow the weird libertarians podcast like we have a bunch of different people. We encourage, we have libertarian socialists, ANCAPs, centrists, oh, yeah, minarchists. I, I, I get that. Listen, I like know? diversity of opinion when it's like a podcast platform like this, but sure. we are a political caucus that's like that's saying, listen, we can't, we can't make every issue our issue. We picked, you know, a handful of things and say, these are where we're going to focus. Um, right. And it's not that we've never talked about immigration. We've talked, we've criticized uh, how immigration is done. Like we've criticized ICE. Yeah. We've crit criticized the Department of Homeland Security. Sure. Um, you know, we've criticized the border wall. Um, but we, but like, we got, we also have to remember that the immigration, now listen, I'm an open borders person. So like, I'm going to preface that because otherwise what I'm about to say, you could run away with and misconstrue. Um, immigration is a tricky issue. And I think that there's room for good faith disagreement on how yeah. borders get dealt with. I mean, you first of all, you have the divide between anarchists and minarchists. And if you're a minarchist, like like an anarchist is going to say abolish political borders, and the minarchist is just going to say we'll have them, but like have as free movement as possible. And then there's just there's different levels of like how open or closed they are. Like you can have like an Ellis Island kind of situation, or you know, or, or you can have just totally closed, or you can have uh, you know, letting people in, but just checking if they have like, you know, any wanted criminal uh, things associated with that, that person's name or face or whatever. I mean, there's so many ways to do immigration and uh, it's just not a subject that we as a caucus are going to say, if you don't agree with us 100% across the line on, on this position on the borders, that you can't be part of the caucus, you can't be associated with us, you can't work with us on these other five things that if you do agree with us on, well, let's work towards those. Um, you know, if, if another caucus wants to form and you guys want to have a different set of priorities, do go do that. Like if you, if you don't like that the Mises caucus doesn't focus on borders, how about you go create a caucus that focuses on borders instead of so, spending all your time blasting the Mises caucus? That seems way more productive. 
So I think I think what Hody and I are trying to get across is that some of those points you're attempting to make are mutually exclusive with closed borders. So I think what we're trying to point out is it you're trying to divorce something that cannot be divorced. As high, as I believe it was Mises, it might have been Hayek said that freedom is is the combination of all freedoms, not just you know one variety of freedom, whether that's social or financial or monetary. It's it's the combination of all freedoms. And I think what you f- folks, you know, being members of the Mises Caucus at large, tend to fail to see again that which is unseen is that people looking at you from the outside, you made the comment earlier that first and foremost, you wanna treat people as individuals. People looking from the outside right now and looking at comments that you folks make disparaging trans rights, disparaging other things like that, they don't see you treating people as individuals. They don't even see you treating them as people. That is the core problem here is that there's a dehumanizing language that the Mises caucus tends to retreat to where they say, Oh no, that's, that's not our business. Leave that to the other people who care about those things. We're talking about human rights here. I mean, this is not, and you can say, Oh, there's already laws, you know, to protect people. Anybody who know I, I have a, a BA in history. So I studied American and European history quite extensively. And if you look back at the history of America you do not see people enjoying rights equally throughout various parts of the country through, you know, once Northern soldiers left the South, like that's when de facto Jim Crow went into effect until it became, you know, facto by law codified later. And those people did not enjoy the rights that we would have thought they should have via and the that constitution. Was wrong, and the Mises caucus would oppose that. If Jim Crow existed today, the Mises caucus would be very loudly opposing but, that. But we, what we I'm saying is there's, politics. We, that but, means- but there's not, but what you're, what you label as identity politics other the vast majority of the overton window of like you know public discourse would say what you are saying is an identity politics issue is actually um dehumanizing language and you guys can say all you want that that's identity politics that's identity politics but the overton window and the vast majority of americans (laughs) say, no, you need to have a baseline recognition that there are some people that have been traditionally screwed over by our justice system, which I think we should all be able to agree is not very just in how it operates today. So why the hell should we think that those people would have um, received just treatment in the past? And why why shouldn't we be looking out for ways in which the, the state the the big evil that we should all be fighting against is coming down harder on them than they are other people. Like why the hell are we defaulting to the side of the state? Because that is the implicit argument that people are making when they come and they go against, they rail against things like trans rights and whatnot. You're saying, wait a minute, I kind of like how the cops have been beating you up all the time. I don't really care and I don't want to get into that. And it becomes this sort of weasel way to get out of stuff. And and the, the biggest example of this happening in the party and what, what I'm so scared about with all this talk of the takeover and all that sort of stuff is back in 2004, prior to 2004, the convention that, that year, the, um, the wording in support of open borders was explicitly clear in the actual uh, bylaw or in the planks of the LP. And it was in that year that they decided they wanted to gut all the planks and then attempt to bring in the paleos and bring in a bunch of other, you know, audience members that they didn't think they were potentially uh, reaching out to before. And they added a weasel word into the plank, which was that we support, um, we don't support any unreasonable measures to prevent people from crossing the border. And then with that one word, they opened up a can of worms that basically allowed anybody to come in and say, that person doesn't deserve to cross the line. And and that's why I think I find it, I, you know, I'm speaking as somebody who is the grandson of three out of four immigrants who came, you know, into this country within the past 60 years. So it's something that is very I close to me, you know, and I, but you know what, we're both white. We came from Europe. You know, we had a big advantage in our grandparents getting in Jewish, that. But I mean, well, you pass as white, and that's the reality of it. Oh, I pass um, as white. And okay. 
it, man, it, I, it's it's something that uh, I, I don't know. It's it's hard because obviously I'm, 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 I'm not Jewish enough the... that that Hitler would have killed me. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, <laughs> but, at the, you know, some border agent, though, to some border agent, you're white. And at, at the end of the day, though, that I think what what I my major problem and and again it stems to the fact that that you brand yourselves as Mises and and use his name to proclaim these these statements but i think that the in a, or the complete um uh unwillingness to speak against ills of the state against marginalized people who can be shown through clear data that they've been marginalized and and particularly abused by the state um, the fact that you can't come out and clearly disavow them, like that people like Angela can't say, no, that was wrong to say people that the Jews are on Hollywood or to say that, no, that was wrong. That Hotep Jesus said what, whatever, you know, about the Jews. It, it, it's something where you, uh, it means a lot more to everybody else outside the party and who we can potentially bring in. And unfortunately, I just worry that there's a lot of messaging that's poisoning the well. And it might be, you know, kind of shoring down and trying to bring in people like us. But the problem is people like us, if that's the only target audience, we ain't going to win in the long term. And we need to embrace that fact and, and realize that the way that we're going to win and get the message of liberty is by getting it to every try you know, getting to every single variety of person we can possibly do. Um, and unfortunately, I just feel like if, if we continue playing this game of not coming out and saying, no, that person should not be allowed to be abused by the state like that. And yes, maybe we should have some laws that make sure the state doesn't exercise in more abuse um, or allowance of abuse, then I, I don't see the problem with that. And if that is going to be something that allows us to, to move forward in a unified way. Um, but I don't know. That's, yeah, that's kind of where I come from. Jacob, I, I'm going to give you the very last word on this. It's just before we move into the peace of my mind segment, because okay. just we're a little over time, but that was a long, that was a long thing. And you deserve a chance to respond. I do want to throw in with, with Jordan, just while you're responding to everything, I did want to fit in there that like, my my thing with what they call cultural Marxism, first of all, look up cultural Marxism, not not you, I'm sure you have Jacob, but anybody listening, look it up. It is a fictitious word. It is made by people who really don't like social progression stuff and they mm -hmm. try to link it to communism. That is a really lame thing because I really, uh, among all of the economists that I've read, Marx is perhaps the most reprehensible. He's very open with his murder. He's very open with, yes, this is what we do to minorities. He was very, very Machiavellian. Yeah. Right. And it's funny how you talk, like, that's funny that SJW stuff gets linked to Marx because he loved systems and languages that oppressed minority in individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes that might, my, my minority maybe controlled the disproportionate amount of things, but he loved language that, you know, to use language and use these Im implement I implicit systems that repressed people that he wanted to repress, you know? And so I think for me, I think it's funny because I just, being a student of history and Jordan, I know you, uh, you actually have the education to back it up. I just enjoy history. I'll call myself a history enthusiast, I guess, not not a master, but you know, being, being somebody who loves history, I see these things and I just kind of say like, why am I getting called a cultural Marxist? Again, and 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 Jacob, I, I feel bad that you have to respond all, for all these people because you're not part of the problem. But we get, you know, for me, it, like I said, it's a it's a thing that I can count on people from the Mises Caucus having a problem when I say when there's a bill that says, "Hey, let's forbid the free market from giving trans people any health care at all." I can count on me saying something bad about it, and the Mises Caucus saying something bad about me and relating it to cultural Marxism, and it's and. I shouldn't say the Mises Caucus. Individuals that right. are affiliated that like to call themselves affiliated right. with the Mises Caucus, right? And for me, it's that culture. Because I and where I was going with the weird libertarian thing, because you are correct. This is a podcast, you're a caucus. You guys have your focuses, we have our focuses. It's a it's a totally different thing. I understand. It's not beasts that we can compare. But we have had to do some like we do proactive damage control. 
And what this isn't is just, did you delete enough posts? Because I think that's what the outrage people want. Did you delete all these things? Did you get rid of all these things? I think for me, the, the, the culture that I'm searching for is more of an embrace of being like, man, I am I'm celebrating trans rights. I celebrate individualism. I celebrate diversity. I really but, but, enjoy but, not every, but like, all right, go, uh, go ahead. That's all the, I had. The, the problem is a lot of these things are just divisive. And like, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to call you tone death, Hody, but I think that it, it is a little like, we have to understand there's a cultural divide in our society. Like not everybody embraces what you would call trans rights. Like there's a lot of people in, in our society that have a different view on the the like subject of transgenderism, and that, that's a, that's a large portion of of society. Um, I kind of find myself in the middle of both extremes, to be honest. Like, I mean, I use I, I use trans people's pronouns, and I treat trans people with respect, and I really like I don't go through life thinking about like what trans people do. Like, it it, it doesn't cross my mind. It's um, not a middle ground. That's the right thing to do. You're a good man. Yeah. At, at the same time, like I, I think a lot of people who go out there at, like performing activism for tr for what you call trans rights they a go about it in really counterproductive toxic ways and b a lot of their rhetoric i just don't i don't agree with and i and then on the other side there's people that have concerns because they have different beliefs often maybe influenced by religion and we have to be we have to like as much as we should respect trans people and 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 their beliefs we have to also respect that people you know have religious beliefs that might come in conflict conflict with that um and and, and it's tough like the, the 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 culture wars is a thing that's going on and we can't be tone deaf to it i don't think we should pick a side but i think the problem is like i think the mises caucus doesn't pick a side as much as maybe its critics say that we do but i think the problem is like we just aren't willing to demonize a whole group of people on one side of it that I feel like a lot of people, I'm not saying necessarily either you, Hody, or you, Jordan. I don't know you, I don't know you that well, Jordan, but I've never seen this from Hody. Um, but I feel like a lot of people on the more, and I agree, cultural Marxism is kind of a dumb term. I, I, it's hard to come up with like a, a precise all It's like feminine. We yeah, want yeah. to make guys. Thanks um, for coming in. No, I'm kidding. Go yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um but the uh, I lost my train of thought now. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, but there's a lot of people um, on on that on that side of, of the aisle that like if you just don't agree with them, then like you're a bigot, you're a bad person, and you know they aren't willing to agree to to disagree. And while there is like there's toxicity on both sides, um, yeah, there's people uh, on the right associated with or not associated with Mises who have said some things that I find uh, just to be in bad taste, to be rude, to be uh, even vulgar at times. Um, I, I see a lot of people wanting to focus on that and demonize us for it, but not a lot going the other direction. And not on, like I see, in my opinion, I see more people on the right side of the aisle of the culture war who say, like, well, why can't we just agree to disagree? Like, I don't have to, like, listen, there, there are like conservative Christians who just want to say, listen, I don't think that a, a, a person who was born biologically a man who says that uh you know they experience gender dysphoria and then they they want to undergo uh some transition or they want to identify as as a as a woman in their personhood trapped in a man's body and then you know cultural conservatives uh say like you know like you know not trying to demonize the person but they just they don't agree with that they don't they don't uh they don't see it the same way uh, though, those people get demonized at the same time, like me as a, and I know you're a Christian too, Hody, like, I believe I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, my Lord and savior. Okay. Mm -hmm. People who don't believe in Jesus, who think that I'm wrong, they are implicitly saying that on some level I'm delusional or that I'm in some level on some level in my mind, I am believing a lie that, and it's like, now, like, does sometimes people criticize in Christianity? Does that like, make me uncomfortable? Does that upset me? Absolutely. But I ha like we have to be willing to understand that not everybody is going to have the same, uh, and this is where the Mises Caucus, I think, is absolutely right in their playing on lifestyle choices. We say, listen, as long as you aren't advocating for violence or statism, like, we really don't care. And listen, there are trans people and gay people and people of all stripes and colors in our caucus. I, I don't think the divide of the Mises Caucus versus the rest of the party is uh, the Mises Caucus is a bunch of right-wing paleos who are trying to own the libs and everybody else. 
I, I just, I don't see that. What I see is a lot of people who are united on prioritizing certain issues and prioritizing, a, we didn't get into strategy much, but there's a specific strategy that the Mises Caucus is promoting. So there's a lot of people outside the Mises Caucus that look at what we're prioritizing in our message and what our strategy is, and they don't like that. And they disagree with that. So there's a massive disagreement on those lines. And then this culture war stuff gets overlaid on top of that. And that's, that's the way I see things. I'm not going to say that uh, everybody in Mises Caucus leadership has always handled things right. Listen, I went and, and I'll say this publicly, I went and talked to Angela McArdle privately after that Q&A and said, and I, I went to everyone in the Mises Caucus leadership team and said, I don't really think that was like the best way to answer those questions. And like, listen, I, I have said this publicly. I think sometimes, like, I think that we are unfairly criticized and attacked a lot. And I think that's made us a little bit, a lot of people hyper defensive and unwilling to acknowledge criticisms. Do I like that? No. Is that human nature and just natural when you have a group that's like constantly under uh, sure. attack by what I think ba is bad faith accusations and attacks? It's kind of natural. And I, I try to pump the brakes a little bit and be kind of a voice of reason to be like, you know, and listen, I, I, no, no. We probably disagree a little bit on the Hotep stuff. I don't like everything Hotep's ever said. I think he's said things that are blatantly anti-Semitic and that I don't like. I also think he's trending towards our side, and I want to encourage that. Um, and, like, again, this is what I talked about earlier. How do we engage with people who have bad beliefs? I don't think the answer is gatekeeping and ostracizing them and kicking them to the curb. Now, can you say that maybe you can go too far the other But would you say that direction? about communists? You don't do that with communists. You do kick them to the curb. <laughs> um, if there are communists that are trending towards, like, if, a, if an ex-communist came and said, I read uh, Man Economy in the Stock? State or A New Liberty, and now I am identifying as an anarcho-capitalist, but they maybe have some lingering, like, bad ideas from their, an their communist days, I'm going to want to invite them in and be friends with them and try to encourage them to keep going down that journey and embracing better and better ideas. And there's no perfect way to go about this. It's some, life is messy sometimes. And yeah. when you're trying to engage, like it's easy when you're playing uh, like, uh, like within libertarianism, like we can just be open and say what, like just, you know, lay it on the line, but we're trying to bring people like, listen, we have to understand we're radicals. Okay. Libertarianism compared to the rest of the world, we are a radical movement. We are uh, a radical ideology, okay? We believe that on every level of society that interactions between individuals should be completely voluntary and all coercion, all systems of coercion should be removed and that people should engage in voluntarism. That is directly flying in the face of the structures in our society today. And we have to realize that, like, you, we don't like we, we have to engage with a lot of people that are coming from different backgrounds, both economically and socially. And we we can easily change, I think, through argumentation and good faith discussions, people's economic views and their views of political systems. But it's not as but but like we can't bring the culture war into this. If if you want the Libertarian Party to be all left, like, OK, but like if there's people that agree with you on economics and the political uh, status of the state, but they have completely different cultural views, if you're willing to dis agree to disagree, to put those disagreements to the side and work towards common, common goals, you're not going to find enemies. I mean, listen, I mean, you, you might find the, the oddball person who is disgruntled or says mean things on Twitter. That's always going to happen. But the general trend, the, the, the overall uh, majority of the people in Mises, you're not going to find an enemy with. That that that's my bottom line. Yeah. Well, thank you both for your thoughts on that. I do appreciate it. Uh, I know we went a little over time, but I feel like that's a subject. If any subject deserves it, that's probably one that deserves a little extra focus here. Um, we're going to get to the peace of my mind segment. I will once again uh, lead because I like I'm a me first guy. What can I say? <laughs> um, so mine's pretty quick, uh, thankfully, because I know we got to shorten things up a little bit. Um, so just recently, I, I mean, after Biden appointed, uh, a Raytheon CEO to, to lead up the defense department, of course, the next, uh, appointment looks to be this guy named David Chipman. 
and uh, for the ATF. Now, it's the it's it's the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Libertarians are going to hate this department no matter what. Okay, so like, there's no there. It, it, it's it's very there's no redeeming it. It's it's like having like the Nazi branch of the government. You're just like, okay, well, obviously we hate that, right? There's no, there's no way this is going to be a good thing. So he's automatically not in a good place. But David Chipman, I would have a tough time making a worse selection than Chipman. And I I feel like it's one of those, while I accept a lot of opinions, I feel like this is one you can almost prove. Um, now, he's been working, obviously, as a libertarian. So he's anti-gun. He's been working at uh, uh, for Giffords, uh, the senior policy uh, group. He's been a senior policy advisor for the Giffords. Um, Giffords is a group uh, named after Gabrielle Giffords, who, of course, was wounded um, in a shooting. Uh, and I understand, like, okay, that's your opinion. You know, you, you want, like, harsher gun control. The more important thing is this guy was part of the Waco raid when he was with the FBI. Now, he's been with the FBI for 25 years. Um, there is no, there's just factually been no bigger disaster for, I mean, well, I guess I can't say factually because they've been meddling in other nations too, but at least locally, there's no bigger disaster that the FBI has done, I guess, publicly than, than Waco. I mean, it was just, it was mishandled all around. He was actually part of a team and I had to look this up, but when it, you know, obviously when they murdered a bunch of women and children, you know, before saying it was an accident, they went around saying they had to do it. And they went about demonizing uh, some of them by saying they were shooting down their helicopters. Now it is true that their helicopters were shot at, but he made an emphasis to say they were shot down, which was a verifiable lie. And it spurned public, you know, the public against these, he basically took to the war of public opinion. So what we have is somebody who engages in propaganda whenever they think he's wrong, whenever somebody thinks he's done something wrong, as opposed to takes accountability, and that person is nominated. Biden doesn't get to make the selection. It does have to be a nomination, but they got 51 votes, so we'll see what happens. Um, but he is tabbed as the nominee to lead the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. All I can say is it's bad. Um, this is, it, it's time to come around. If, Joe, if you're holding out on Joe Biden, maybe doing the right thing here or like maybe becoming that libertarian president you're hoping for, you're going to be waiting a while. This is bad. It needs to be derided as bad. I understand maybe some forgiveness, but the problem is, is he's not asked for forgiveness. He's not come around. David Chipman has not changed who he is as a person. He is actively anti-gun. Biden tabbed him because he is anti-gun and he's the right person for the job. Who's yeah, Biden is apparently, and this may be a subject we'll talk about even next week, but uh, apparently he's got, and I haven't seen him, but six executive orders lined up ready to tackle um, legal gun owners. So it's it's a scary thing. David Chipman uh, sucks. Um, Jacob, what do, you, what do you think of it? ATF and uh, David Chipman. Uh, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of like this non-obvious cliche, like outrage to have towards just anything related to the ATF. Um, which, well, you know, what's funny, a little, little tangent here. Um, I, I work on cars for a living and, uh, transmission specifically, and we call automatic transmission fluid ATF. So, um, I'm in this constant internal struggle anytime someone <laughs> uses that acronym. Um, but, uh, it's okay. Biden has struggles with it too. For those of <laughs> yeah. you, did you see he called it AFT the whole time in the press oh, conference, just AFT, AFT. <sighs> Sorry. And I know I, I, there's plenty of good reasons to dislike Joe Biden. If it's a slip of the tongue, I say we give that to him, but it, it just fit in with the joke. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's very concerning. I mean, we're, we're, it's just, it's a recipe for disaster that we've been, you know, locking Americans in their homes, telling them not to go to work, creating all this economic turmoil, uh, you know, playing on the tensions of the culture war. Um, and, you know, this is a powder keg ready to go off. And, uh, you know, anytime you start, you know, <laughs> it's it, the only thing it's good for is gun sales, which, you know, I mean, it's still good luck right now. If you're a gun owner trying to go out there and buy ammunition and, and guns right now, it's been it's been crazy for the past uh, the past year. It's been like you can't you can't get anything. Um, yeah, it's very concerning. Um, I mean, my, my favorite thing to say about uh, gun control is that. 
Um, and I, I actually, I stole this from uh, Dave Smith, which is, um, I'm very concerned about gun violence. Uh, the minute we perform universal background checks on everybody in government and, uh, you know, every, anybody in state power to make sure that they're not responsible for the uh, death of millions of people, both home and abroad, uh, you know, then they can have all my guns. Jordan, anything glowing to say about the ATF? <laughs> oh man, or so Chipman's history? Like, did it. Um, well, well, I, what I was going to say is, if for anybody who has seen the horrifying miniseries Waco, which I think is probably still available on on Netflix, it's right. actually it covers it actually manages to span two horrible um, infringements uh, and encroachments on individuals because it actually covers Ruby Ridge at the right right at the beginning of the Waco miniseries um but i think the character i think they they had to rename the guy who was actually this um chipping um i believe that he was known as mitch decker in that miniseries who was an absolutely reprehensible person and probably pretty accurate to to how chipping really is and probably why they didn't get to use his real name in the, in the mini series. So um, yeah, for anybody who's, I would highly recommend it for what it's worth. Um, it's, it's a, actually a good series, I think, to get people to question, um, you know, sort of normies, so to speak, to kind of see, you know, in a very pop culture sort of way, easily accessible, the, the overreaches of our federal government. And, um, and so I it think actually um, gave it, 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 gave, it gave a fair treatment of that. Like, cause I, I was skeptical to watch it. Cause I just kind of felt like it would, it would not be. Oh, accurate. Oh, It'll make you want to abolish the police. It like, does. It's very... <laughs> I was very, I was pleasantly surprised quite honestly at just oh, how, to check it out. um, you know, they don't, I wouldn't say they, they glaze over kind of, uh, uh, you know, what's his name? Um, the, Br the British uh, Davidians were not. Innocent. Yeah, they didn't. Okay. They didn't glaze they, over like their insanity. Friends either. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. so like they, I, I do think it was well represented though on the whole. So I, for, yeah. For, so if you want to know that guy uh, though, I would say watch that movie. And I'm pretty sure, or the miniseries, I'm pretty sure it's Mitch Decker is is who's supposed to represent him or or a composite of him and a couple other terrible human beings right. probably. So yeah, it's a it's a good one. It, it'll radicalize in normal people. Like yeah. Like, yeah, I should have gone more into that. Waco was bad, and this guy had a lot to do with it. So there's that. Jor Jordan, give us a piece of your mind. Sure. Well, um, I want to do something that I don't think we do enough of, and that is celebrate really awesome things about the free market and how, like, sometimes the free market just kind of blows my mind. It, like, things like spontaneous order in particular and, like, um, things like how people find one another on Twitter and all of a sudden some little kid like gets a new signed skateboard from Tony Hawk because, you know, some some guy posted a picture of, you know, this this kid's little skateboard he had where he wrote Tony Hawk on it. And like, you know, just those awesome coincidences of things kind of coming together. And I think something that has been lost in the past year or two, um, you know, as as we kind of enter into year two of, of this pandemic, um, is the amazing way in which the free market has made the pandemic survivable for so I mean we've lost you know going on 600,000 people but let's just think about how the pandemic has been mitigated by unbelievable advances by humans and innovation and you know first and foremost we see like an unheard of pivot to distributed workforces for knowledge workers. Like think about how crazy this was for most companies out there that um, you know were operating where most people come in every day to the office and overnight, like companies were able to maintain business continuity and people just started working from home. Like we didn't, I don't think there was enough of a recognition of like just how amazing that really is and like how many, uh, how much, you know, different technologies had to be invented via the free market in order to enable that to actually happen and not, you know, bring everything Everything crashing down. I think, though, the, the one I want to celebrate the most, though, and it, this might be a little bit um, perhaps uh, uh, contentious, I, I don't know, but um, is honestly the vaccines. Um, it's an unbelievable testament to man's engineering and the unbelievable leaps in, in taming, you know, nature and the and life around us that 
we were able to process that in, in the time that we did. Um, I actually happened to, to know somebody at one of the major pharma producers who was part of one of the teams that, that developed it. Um, and kind of seeing that inside track of like how many hours went into it, how they were killing themselves to like get it out and like all of the rigorous testing it went through and, and, and really finding out just how much of the the speediness was because unnecessary FDA crap was cleared out of the way for them. And it it really makes you think like, um, you know, just how much of our sort of collective portfolio of maladies might be solved sooner rather than later if we were to get the FDA out of the way. And, and you know, so um, I'm happy to report, I'm lucky, I, I um, Michigan recently opened up uh, for people without chronic um, issues. Um, they were already open for people with that earlier, but um, I'm lucky to, to not have one that that would have qualified. So um, I'm I'm going to be able to get my first shot tomorrow at uh, at the big house at the U of M Stadium. Um, so I'm going to very excitedly do that because I am looking forward to joining um, humanity externally again. Um, and then likewise, we'll be getting my depending on which shot I get, I'll probably be getting my follow up. But again, I, I think there's a there's a tendency for folks. Um, you know, and the, the lunatic fringe loves to dive into that as the mark of the beast and everything else. Um, and I don't necessarily want to go down any rabbit holes. You're going to be a here. walking 5G um, Wi-Fi tower. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> like, yes. Now I can finally which, hear Which, which would make me want to get brain. it more, actually. I yeah. like, <laughs> if, I have, if I could have on-demand 5G, man, <laughs> right. I, would, I would, like, break laws to get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, yeah so, uh, long story short, I really just want to celebrate the the marvel that is the free market and you know and and not only did it it it's going to ultimately pull us out of it it's ultimately what um you know is is uh getting us through it like think about what amazon and what streaming services and everything else is meant to all of our respective sanities like it's just it's a it's a time to look back and i think reflect on um things actually were pretty good and could have been a heck of a lot worse if it weren't for entrepreneurs out there looking to make a buck out of off our happiness. Yeah, I, you know? I, I agree with a lot of that. And the only the only the sad thing is knowing how much how many more lives could have been saved and how much less economic damage would have been done mm. if the free market were allowed to truly respond to the pandemic. Mm. We, the, we libertarians know it could. Yeah. Uh, like pretty much all the missteps that were taken towards the handling of this pandemic were because of the government, were because of either people trying to cover things up or because of people underplaying or overplaying things uh, and, and all the red tape and stuff. Not not just around the, you know, the, the vaccine's a little bit controversial. I don't believe any conspiracy theories about it. Um, I'm just, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I need to learn more about the, the way this, you know, the mRNA vaccine differs from traditional ones. I'm not really against it, but I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of on the fence. So I'm, what I'm personally going to do, uh, completely fine with other people who want to get it. I don't think it's like, you know, the mark of the beast or anything silly like that. Um, but, but not just the vaccine. Like it's, it's, it's sad that like, you know, one of the, the, uh, things we kept hearing was flatten the curve because we're worried about, uh, flooding hospitals. And, it, and I was like, well, why, why are you in a free market? You wouldn't just have to lock people down to prevent that problem from happening. Like in a free market where healthcare would be actually able to scale to meet the demand, you know, that that was such a big thing that I was focused on, like exposing all the, the regulations that like, you know, that, that are basically corrupt, that uh, kept us wide open and very like uh, vulnerable to a pandemic happening. It made it so that like, you know, I mean, in a lot of the cities that got hit hard, hospitals were already almost always near capacity. So like all it took was it could have been the pandemic, the pandemic could have been half as bad as it was. And it still would have been uh, a disaster. And it's because of all all the red tape and, and, and government intervention that goes into uh, kind of enforcing a lot of these monopolies and these uh, the prevention of competition and the creation of new hospitals and and new uh, medical facilities and and uh, not not just vaccines, but also uh you know, different drug treatments and, and all that. So it's just, a, it's a shame on one hand to think about all the lost life and all the economic damage caused by the government interventions. Um, but yeah, it is also encouraging to see the ways that just like the, 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 even the free market when it is 
like being choked to death by by the state government it's still it, it's still a, it, it, and it's still able to create these amazing mechanisms that allow people to to still uh flourish and to and to live life and and to to, to limit the you know as things from being as bad as they could have been we don't wow. have too many examples because the state is so overwhelming of like true market action and I think this is one of those incredible moments, especially when we talk about the virus, where people took these cis, cease and desist orders from the government and tore them up and threw them away. And mm -hmm. was like, no, nope, I'm going to keep testing. I'm going to keep working on this vaccine. I'm going to keep, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep this going because this is going to be important. And I'm willing to risk my job and I'm willing to risk my, you know, I mean, a whole career. And I'm willing to risk going to jail, getting fined. I'm willing to risk our company going under because I believe this is working. And this is what the government... Think, imagine that if the government did not have any influence over that, how quick. So I believe the vi the vaccine was, it was invented the day after because they had the sequence. They developed a counter sequence. The weekend, they actually had a counter sample. And then, of course, you know, you know even them, it's funny because while they were breaking government orders, it's not like they were just giving them out. Even they believe in testing. They, they're even the free market is like, hey, we're still going to test this thing. Yeah. We're just going to do it real quick. The government says... I think it's funny, man, there's that whole like, oh, you got the vaccine, you trust the government. Well, the government says I can't have one for like 10 years. Like right. the government had to concede to the free market at every turn because people were like, no, we want this now. You need to get out of the way. You need to make orders and take all these rules that you have and you need to tear them up and you need to get them out of the way. Was government still involved? Yeah, and they really shouldn't have been. So like, I understand, you know, Everybody make the decision for themselves, but how much would have been mitigated? It would have been great. What? I do want to share, I used to be a paramedic. And so this really gets to me hard because people don't think about this part of it, but especially the ventilators. So mm. hospital equipment is actually dispersed at a federally regulated level. And so you are actually not allowed to have like more than one uh, more than X amount of mm -hmm. ultrasound machines for X amount of people. And it's the way they, what it is, it's artificial. Um, it's artificially creating a market that's creating a bubble that's making those pieces of equipment more expensive than they actually are. And that's the reason these laws exist. I mean, they don't even pretend otherwise, you know, because the, the hospitals are like, well, we don't even like, we'll pay you whatever. Like, we just want a whole bunch of these machines. And so it's funny that the ventilation thing came to, bite us in the butts because we said we have to flatten our curves because the curve because we don't have enough ventilators that was regulated the reason we didn't have enough ventilators is because that's regulated by a federal policy and i remember i've had to um i had to bag somebody um to a hospital um that was 45 minutes away because we weren't allowed to have a ventilator in that hospital because that hospital is too close to another hospital that had a ventilator and it was just it's and you know something about the way the population works and it it is the free market really is awesome um i'm glad you brought this up jordan because <laughs> it is a it is something that for me is so celebratory yeah. and i'm glad that after like an hour and a bit of cracking down on like what the frick the mises is doing on like social issues Economic issues are pretty awesome. So and like this is where we can all agree. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Like economic issues are really cool. And so like if you're not on board with like how cool they are, like I, I see these libertarians a lot and I'm friends with them a lot of them. They're all they're all in on the social issues. And they're like, oh, I don't know about the economic issues. And I just want to like crack the egg on them so bad. Just be like, dude, it is really cool. Like what the free market, what voluntary human action does is really cool and really good for people. Well, and, and it's just, it's a shame that like the, the government acting the way it does with these coercive uh, forces and incentives, it, it, it poisons the efforts of the free market. Like, let's, yeah. let's say like, you know, that we knew factually that like the vaccine was, uh, and, and I think it likely is that it's safe. There's no long-term side effects and all that. Um, the reason why people are like hesitant of it is because of the Tuskegee. government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's because, yeah. Yeah. It's because people yeah. are, people are like, well, the, the the government can't be held accountable and we can't trust them uh right. it's a lot easier to trust a a market entity like a like a business or or whatnot who stands to be held accountable for their actions accountable Absolutely. for the harm they cause financially accountable like they'll lose business yeah. uh like so that's that's how the free market is so beautiful and that like people are more able to trust these things when they come out and all the government has has 
uh, lended itself to do is to to poison the well and make people yeah. really has you know and i understand where the people are coming from because it's just everything the government touches it poisons and so right. it's yeah. just it, it it creates like you know especially for people who aren't like like i'm in this weird like i'm not a, a doctor or anything but i have like a lot of friends who are doctors so it's like i'm always talking to them and picking their mind and trying to understand these things and it's tough like you as a consumer you don't want to just like blindly do things blindly just like well i'm just going to trust what people say to put in my body like you want to kind of make an informed uh decision um, but then there's a lot of people that don't even trust the medical community at all just because of how much the government is involved in that and it's just it's a shame uh, and and yeah it's it, it, there's a there's like there's so much hope and optimism in like what we were talking about here with the free market and like i'm, I'm so down with that and i think economics are so important i think that it's not just like uh, like a, a nerdy thing to discuss economic theory. I think economics is like an important part of life that we need to talk about more. Um, and it's just a shame that the the state has to ruin it. Yeah, I would say the two most um, under taught topics in public schools, and you know, ideally, no schools would be public, but uh, publicly funded at least. But the 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 two, I think it was uh, the economist James Buchanan. Um, he he said uh, the single biggest thing that they um, don't teach but should is the nature of spontaneous order. Absolutely. The na the fact that people tend to just work together and tend to naturally subdivide their tasks and go into division of labor, like there isn't, we we don't teach people an appreciation and wonderment really for what that's really doing and and you know something that has pulled ninety eight percent of you know human population of the earth out of. Uh, poverty over the past three or 400 years. Like it's, again, there's this massive wonderment that we just glaze over every day and just don't even think about it. Yeah. All right, Jacob, piece of your mind. Uh, well, we changed my, 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 what they're going to bring up. Um, oh, uh, something that's really been bugging me uh, is the, the, what's going on at the borders. And I mean, like nothing nothing has changed like we're still locking people in the, you know now it's what the uh uh child migrant facilities is now what the uh <laughs> the biden administration oh, is calling overflow them. facilities um yeah and uh, what really pisses me off and that just like i have a lot of friends that you know are, are democrats that are from the left voted for bernie um and and like they were rightfully very critical of trump and and the stuff going on at the border but like they aren't willing to to see how much worse it's gotten because now like, like we've created like the worst possible situation where the messaging and like the platform that was run was like, well, Trump's so bad on immigration and Biden's going to change that. And now like the people coming to the border are coming in larger numbers and they're coming like, like it's almost like we put a welcome mat in front of the chainsaw. It's like we didn't we didn't remove the chainsaw, but now it's like we're lowering people in. It's almost like we're entrapped, like like at least. The, like the only silver lining about the immigration. I wouldn't under know Trump. anything about entrapping people, would they? <laughs> I'm kidding. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, but the, the only silver lining to the Trump immigration policy was that like it was consistent. Like Trump was like, "Don't come here. We don't want you here. And if you come here, we're going to lock you up." And then it was like, now the Democrats are in power, and it's like they just spent, you know, four years like going hysterical about this stuff, and again, rightfully so. But like they they were so. Uh, overwhelmingly uh, negative and and like emboldened to call out this crap, and now it's like nobody wants to do it. To the like, I'm not saying there are some good people on the left still that are doing that, that are trying to still kind of blow the whistle on what's going on. But it's like it's kind of like in hushed reverent. Oh, it's bad, but you know at least it's not Trump. So you know, and it's like they they really don't want to talk about it. How like it's actually gotten worse. Like it's actually worse to trick people into thinking. You can come here now. We want you to come here. Diversity is our strength. Oh, that we're still going to lock you in a cage and take your kids from you and and and, and all this crap that that they're that they're not you know that they're not they're not going to change. And it's just it's so infuriating to try to get this like, just to get this acknowledgement, just to be like, listen, let's let's even say that Trump was such a uh, unmitigated evil that like he just had to be kicked out at any cost and that we had to put Biden in. You can't like like if you're going to say that, fine, but don't ignore what biden's doing hold his feet like the and it pisses me off that the media won't hold his feet to the fire with that same intensity that they were trump and it's just it's so aggravating i 
a couple, you know, so so going into the election, and I mentioned this on a on a post um, that became a little bit popular, but it was the idea was let's kick Trump out and hold Biden accountable. Okay, check, kick Trump out, check that happened. <laughs> hold Biden accountable, having trouble with that check mark right now. Right. And now here's here's the thing. Now, Jacob, it's funny that you bring this up. We actually talked about the problem in immigration. We went into detail on it a couple of weeks ago. Um, not that it's old news. Um, it's getting worse. And it is, I said it then and I'll say it now, this is as bad as it's been. And the, pay, the place that Biden actually increased the enforcement of where you're allowed to take pictures. Um, hmm. And the one facility, he's got one facility that they'll let you take pictures at. This is according to an Axios article. Um, that you're allowed to take pictures at because the other two are so much worse. The one that you're allowed to take pictures at is as bad as anything you saw under Trump. Okay. They, they, so they, imagine now the conditions of those other two. I mean, what we're up to, I think it's funny because two weeks ago it was 14,000 kids and I think it's up to 21,000. Like it's, we're, we're hemorrhaging right now. And I'm glad you bring this up because I think it really fits with the topic, Jacob, is because I do have, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. But there's a couple times that CNN will be like, yeah, this sucks. We dropped the ball. You know what I mean? Like, this is this is ugly. And then you got to hold on to those moments. You know, I mean, Axios of all places is reporting how much worse it's got. You know, and so I do think it's easy to paint with a broad brush and like, look, none of the Democrats care. Okay, that's probably true about most of them because people are partisan and tribal and just being like, well, it's not that they don't care. But like, I mean, you saw Trump at the debates. That had to go, right? Like, I mean, come on, we can't. We can't have a guy who's like downright unhinged. We had to do something, you know, but I think this fits because what it is, is I am very eager to call out the hypocrisy, but I need to curb that feeling because what I need to do is, is make this an evangelical moment right. for my sincere friends on the left who are just like, I am so sick of this. If you thought it was a human violates rights violation then and you still would now if you're an honest person and most of the time when you talk to people of course internet everything's a fight right but when you talk to people genuinely they acknowledge that and i've had several friends that were like i honestly thought biden was going to let all the people that he put in with the 1994 crime bill out by now i really did i really mm -hmm. thought i didn't see the war with syria coming i really thought he was going to pull all the troops back i really thought i mean what he did with um uh, the the no knock warrants. He sent his own war. He sent his own White House lawyers in support of the no knock warrants, arguing against Breonna Taylor. Right, like that. It, it's a disaster, right? Joe Biden's a disaster. So if you were serious about that stuff, and I, and I hope you were, because like I I was with you then. I was a Black Lives Matter person. I was an abolish the ice person. We marched together. Like, if you know me in real life, like, we had protests together. We were friends. We went to rallies together. You know me. You know my priorities. Okay? Right. Are your priorities going to change now? Or you got that same energy? Because I think a lot of times it's it's about keeping the same energy that is really getting, I think, to the hypocrisy bone. Because I think what we've got is we've got an AOC being like, it's kind of bad, but I, I don't know. It, you know it, it, it's, a little, it's bad. It's bad, right? I don't want to say it's not bad, but it, and you check people's Twitter accounts and certain ones like um, respect to Adam Bates. I know a lot of people love him, but he went from tweeting about immigration three times a day to three times in the last eight, four months, right? And it's like, what happened to that energy, man? Like you hated what was going on with immigration. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't, it's a little bit bad. You know, like keep that same energy like that you had then. And that's what I want to, like, I do want to hold keep people accountable, but more so I want to bring them in. That accountability should be an evangelical tool. Absolutely. Because this is something we, the Libertarian Party, do not give ground on. I don't even want to say the Libertarian Party. We, the Libertarian Movement, the Liberty Movement, recognizes that you have the fr the right to travel and to make a better life for yourself. And I don't care if it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden who have each told you to go home and stay home and get taken advantage of by your drug cartels and by your mafias and by your, uh, oh my gosh, sex trafficking rings. Like go home and try to make your own countries better. Screw off. Or, 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 at, the very, or at the very least, can we like like if you're going to have a border, can you can you find a way to enforce that like without like 
perpetually locking without being a monster in. yeah like, like, <laughs> like i was talking about earlier i was like listen like like as much as like, like i'm a pretty radical anarchist in my like f- f- philosophical views um mm-hmm. but like listen if i want to be pragmatic and compromise for a bit like can we at least like you know find Actually, some compromise like can we can we stop enforcing the borders with like i mean the only way it would get worse than this would be if we were literally putting landmines and people with guns and just <laughs> pointing it although that might be better because that would keep people away and you would have less people killed and less people locked up so in a way that's like i what it's just it's a combination of like pretending to be virtuous and better but then like just being the same and, sure. and that's what I hate about the duopoly and, 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 and either side, both the left and the right, when they get caught up in this in this crap where the other side is evil. And it's like it's tough because like I want to like I marched with Black Lives Matter. I, I, I marched with um, and when people when they were uh, protesting police brutality. And it, it, it's tough because like I want to support them um, in those things. But like then it's like. When when suddenly it's the other person in power, it's like they just they lose that passion. It's like they it, it's the uh, it's like it's like democracy. And I'm not a lot of people like sometimes libertarians are split on this. Some like democracy and some don't. I, I tend to lean towards not liking democracy because it's kind of like this opiate that pacifies people. They're like, well, yeah, stuff is still bad, but like democracy worked. We voted and got our guy in. So it, like it makes them more willing to put up with the same evil crap. If your kid's um, been ripped away from you at your border, <laughs> go, yeah. to, go tell them that we got the right guy in charge of ripping away your right. kid. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad Jordan does believe in intellectual property because he said this two weeks ago and I've used it several times since then. But the way the border is being run, it's not an accident. You would have to try mm-hmm. to be as bad as we are to these people. Mm-hmm. If you were just incompetent and weren't very good at your job, you do better than this. And so it's terrorism. We're trying to scare them away. And it's like, you know, because, yeah, Jordan said it. Like, if you just put somebody incompetent of it, it, it would wind up better. Sorry. I, 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 go ahead, Jordan. I, I, no, I, no. I, 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 twice I, in a row now. No. I'm stealing your I, words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I would, I, I would boil it down to, like you said, it is terrorism. Or, or I, the catchphrase that I see used a lot is the cruelty is the point. Like, you know, that that mm-hmm. is why this is the way it is. It's This is intentional. And I, I think that's another thing that we can extrapolate to more just government at large is that a lot of times that when really crappy situations are playing out, it's because someone in government wants it that way because they're benefiting in some way mm-hmm. from it. And I think something that we can do a lot more of just collectively, and, and you know, this some all of us should hopefully be able to do to some extent. I really love this quote from a uh, libertarian uh, uh, fiction author, Robert Lefebvre, um, where he said that um, government is a disease masquerading as its own cure. And I think that that is so often the case when you think about, you know, so many of the things we're talking about here, like how you can track it back two, three steps in the, you know, the, the exercise of the five whys. Why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? Well, why did that happen? Eventually you end back with some, you know, government piece of legislation that is now having an unintended consequence or could have be having a very intended consequence that's being masked as an unintended consequence because that somebody is benefiting, you know, or is, uh, if I can quote, you know, this is actually a big Lebowski t-shirt. So, you know, I'll quote uh, uh, when he's saying, um, it's like Lenin said, you follow the money. And, you know, he's, he's saying, I am the walrus. No, VI Lenin, you know, so, but it's, uh, you know, you follow the money, look who see what will benefit. And that's, you know, really, really what the case is. And you gotta, you gotta dig into it. And I think, we can do a lot more as libertarians to help expose that and and help kind of lead people through that five wise process to show that hey the problem kind of started with government's intrusion to begin with here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, uh, thank you both for your thoughts today. I really appreciate you, uh, Jordan. I know we got you for one more week. Thank goodness for that. I, uh, <laughs> I give your wife a thank you for me. I know you're sure. supposed to be a temporary guy, but. Uh, Supposedly, we'll be getting Aaron back next week. If not, we'll find right. maybe just ask Jordan nicely. But uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, probably haven't seen the last of you because you know. It, uh, I'm it, happy it, to sub in on occasion here and there. All we'll right, see. sweet, sweet. And Jacob, I know you're just a sub in as well, but I appreciate your thoughts, especially talking about this one. Because I mean, talking about the Mises Caucus without somebody on the Mises Caucus in it probably would have got bad. I mean, it's, no, and, and, and I appreciate the invite, and I know it got like you know, anytime the Mises Caucus comes up, it's going to be a little heated and contentious. And but I, I appreciate you inviting me on to talk about it. I appreciate. Uh, you Jordan and uh, you know and you, you were you were pretty fair I think in the things you said even when we disagreed you you were trying to be charitable and I could I could see that and I appreciate that so and hey, Jacob uh, you know never having met yeah uh, I think you know we've we've commented on the same posts here and there on Facebook or something but like um, you know you're the sort of person I want to maintain a dialogue with as opposed to just send ourselves back into our respective uh, echo chambers so you know let's uh, let's keep up the dialogue in, in a civil one so absolutely yeah. I agree. I think we both agree you're too good for him, Jacob. I just, I, <laughs> I know you're going to disagree, but I'm just throwing it out there. Um, so, Jacob, um, where can people like find you at? You have your own podcast that I am, I listen to. It's an Arco Christian podcast for people who like it, but I'll let you hype it up and not me. Yeah. So, uh, my page and uh, podcast, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, podcast is on YouTube, Spotify, all that is uh, Daniel three biblical anarchy. Uh, so like my, my focus on my page and podcast is kind of connecting, uh, the, uh, the Christian faith to the Liberty mm -hmm. movement and showing how, um, a lot of scriptures, a lot of teachings within the church have been warped over time by the state. <laughs> oh, the Book um, of Judges is a yeah. great one. Oh, oh, the Book of Judges is, is an amazing <laughs> book. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but yeah, that, that, you know, I, I talk. I have a lot of people on, and we talk about these things, uh, you know, and, and other things as well. But that's the focus of the of the page and the podcast is just to show how uh, you know the Christian should be embracing the the mantra of the early church, which was no king but Christ, which is to uh, not bow down to Caesar uh, and to uh to live that out consistently so you can you can find me there uh facebook twitter youtube i, I got a website i'm working on but i have no time so <laughs> <It'll> <laughs> jordan is there anything jordan is there anything you want to hype up um no i tend to be a lurker in the liberty movement movement most of the time i um i tend to like to just kind of get introduce you know get into conversations here or there and um support causes i like financially and, and when where i can um if anybody wants to reach out to me though i'm always happy to chat i'm uh, you can find me on um facebook uh, as jordan c Kleinsmith. it's really where i'm most active i don't really i i mostly use twitter for trolling that's about it <laughs> can you use twitter for trolling big else? brands that yeah well they mad. limit you to 140 characters oh give us your full <laughs> thoughts on the fed like, oh okay let me be right. nuanced about this <laughs> i think it's funny when people try and they're like all right this is part one of 20 so just keep, right yeah. <laughs> well thank you both so much for coming out guys this is a great one and i Listeners, if you're listening, I really appreciate you listening, being part of the conversation. We have a lot of these tough conversations like this, but if you like it, please subscribe to the Weird Libertarians Network. Give us a follow. Show us off to your friends. Um, they've deleted us on social media and YouTube and all that stuff. So the only way we're getting out is by you telling people how awesome we are. Our views are still great, and they're still going up, but we're just saying if they're going to go up further, we need your help. So thanks so much again, guys. We'll talk to you.